We are in the sixth session of the day. This is um, coming near to the end. We have four fantastic speakers. We're going to start with Tong Ki. And if I pronounce that uh, incorrectly, please correct me when you speak. And followed by Antoine Sejourné, um, followed by Sue Natalie and Ted Schur. We'll wrap it up. Okay, so I'm going to hand the floor over to Tong. Okay, wonderful. Uh, it's good to be here. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Tong Q. I'm from Penn State. Uh, the organization I represent is the Cryo Slide Risk. Um, as you know, that uh, the, with the degradation of permafrost, we have uh, more and more widespread of mass movement hazards in the cryosphere. So, in, uh, so with that, uh, these mass movement hazards will have an impact on our infrastructure. So the objective of this organization is to establish a convergent research team to address infrastructure resilience and adaptation to climate change amid uh, increasing mass movement risks across the cryosphere. So we, we got the initial funding for National Science Foundations uh, um, navigating the new Arctic program. So this is a planning grant. So we have uh, two universities behind this. Uh, the one is Penn State, and I uh, also have my, my colleague, Cao Peng. Cao Peng is um, an early adopter of machine learning in water resources. And uh, the, our, another, another university is University of Alaska Fairbanks. We have uh, Margaret Darrow and uh, Louis, both are permafrost uh, or cold region engineers. So uh, a lot of our activities center around two workshops. So the first workshop we organized this at the Penn State uh, from May uh, last year, from May 12th to 13th. I think uh, I, I see some familiar names in the audience that they participated in the workshop in May. For example, Professor Grouper actually gave a keynote uh, in our workshop in two thousand last year, and I also see uh, Lucas. <laughs> Lucas was very actively uh, was very active in the workshop last year. So we had uh, uh, thirty four participants. It was a hybrid uh, workshop. So we have eighteen people participating in person, and we have some folks participating remotely. We had engineers, geologists, the computer scientists, and the government officials representing uh, uh, different stakeholders uh, for this bigger topic. And uh, we also have uh, uh, expertise uh, covering remote sensing, mapping of uh, uh, mass movement hazards, permafrost, machine learning, computer vision, and the cold region engineers. So during this workshop, we discussed uh, various topics uh, behind this uh, uh, infrastructure resiliency and adaptation. And we felt that, that there are a lot of uh, things. One thing leads to another. We have uh, different processes involved. So we have uh, first uh, the bigger picture. We have this uh, atmospheric warming. And with atmospheric warming would lead to permafrost thaw. Uh, there, is a, there is a lag. And then the purpose for us, the thaw will lead, to, will lead to mass movement risk, which leads to vulnerability of our infrastructure, which leads to infrastructure resiliency and adaptation. So we discussed that um, our capability to understand and or, or predict each process really depends on our capability to understand or predict the previous process. So this is a series of processes. With that, we feel that uh, machine learning probably has uh, can play a role. So the objective, so the focus of the first workshop in 2022 two was about machine learning. So uh, we have uh, two objectives. The first one is to apply machine learning for mapping mass movement uh, hazards and apply AI for forecasting such hazards across the cryosphere. The second one is to identify key knowledge gaps in reliable and accurate cry cryospheric hazard mapping and the forecasting. So our uh, last year's workshop had a clearly AI machine learning focus. And let's see what we learned from the participation from this uh, past workshop. What we learned was uh, using machine learning to map mass movement hazards has a great potential and also reliable and accurate maps for future mass movement hazards will be very useful uh, for practitioners and the policy makers for infrastructure planning purposes, uh, uh, at least for that. 
And then the workshop, in the workshop, we also identified some challenges. The first one is a lack of a global or even regional landslide databases. Um, currently, uh, I, we have a project funded by uh, Google. Essentially, we want to establish a global landslide database, but that is mo mo that is based on uh, that will be rainfall in triggered landslide da database. So here we're going to try to tackle a mass movement risk due to um, um, due to this uh, uh, climate change. So that is a slightly different. Another one is uh, we um, use machine learning. We can use this, we can train our AI, AI models, but then the model trained based on the data from one eco region will have a hard time predicting the debris landslide risk in another eco region. And also we have a we have a different types of mass movement hazards right in, in the cryosphere. So you you build machine learning models trained based on one type of uh, mass movement. We're going to have a hard time uh, to generalize this to other types of mass movement. So at the end, we were concluded that we need an international working group. So to this um, uh, such as what, what such such as the, the purpose of uh, today's permafrost uh, uh, day, and this working group should establish protocols for data sharing and the benchmarking the performance of the different models. So I think uh, I'm just uh, I think we're preaching to the choir. So everybody is fully aware of this, and I'm glad that we have a different breakout session to address various topics. Um, and then uh, we we are planning on for the second workshop, <laughs> which is will be later this year. It's from September seventh to eighth, um, and that is uh, that is the weekend after our Labor Day weekend. So <laughs> hopefully we can capture more audience. We are going to be in University of Alaska Fairbanks. Now the second workshop we are going to be more focused on permafrost uh, physics because uh, we are trying to incorporate uh, phys permafrost physics into machine learning. So we have a sort of um, uh, physics informed machine learning. I feel that it might be more appropriate. So now we in this workshop, because we're going to be in Alaska, so we would have, uh, in addition to the previous stakeholders that we, we talked about, probably what we're, we, we look forward to involving Alaska indigenous people, because I do feel um, uh, we say nat oh, natural hazards, they don't uh, discriminate. However, the impact of these hazards, they do disproportionately impact uh, uh, minority uh, underserving communities. In this case, it's the Alaska indigenous people. So we look forward to, get, uh, to getting their input. So for the second workshop, uh, we have uh, three objectives. Uh, the first one is to identify public and the private agency concerns and the challenges related to mass movement impacts on infrastructure in a changing climate. Uh, the second one is uh, to develop, develop research priorities to address the identified challenges. The third one is we want to summarize all these challenges re related to mass movement hazards uh, and also the possibility of using AI machine learning to address these issues. We want to summarize those in, um, in a peer reviewed thesis article. Uh, that's sort of our deliverable to, to NSF. And also um, uh, the ultimate goal is we want to identify these challenges. We want, want to establish some collaborations and then maybe uh, later, uh, uh, early next year in January, 2024, we would like to write a bigger proposal, research proposal to NSF, uh, the new, the navigating the new active program to address this, uh, in a, in a re, uh, to address this in a research proposal. So that is a, a, a quick summary of what we did here. Thank you. And the next speaker is Antoine Sejournet. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's it's, uh, it's night uh, for Paris, so good afternoon also for uh, our colleagues from overseas. Um, I'm going to present our project uh, called Prismatic. It aims at understanding the evolution of uh, evolution of small permafrost watershed in the Arctic and raising awareness of local communities about climate change. Our consortium is composed of different scientists and stakeholders, primary school, 
from France, Russia, Canada, USA, and Japan. And uh, we are funded thanks to the uh, Belmont Forum Co., which is an organization that gather different research agency about the sustainability of soil and groundwater for society. Of course, we had a lot of uh, nice presentation about the problematic of uh, carbon and trapped element, the permafrost and the impact of uh, a permafrost. So, um, so there is really a need to better study the impact of this diversity across the Arctic. And uh, also permafrost so has been uh, widely observed to alter the bio geochemistry and ecology of uh, different aquatic ecosystems. Uh, numerous study and, and, and work show that uh, there is very uh, an important variation at the regional scales about these responses. And they can sometimes they can be an increase in some uh, chemical elements, sometimes can be a decrease depending on the area. So there is really a need to quantify how these regional landscape specific factors, parameters, can constrain these responses, biogeochemical responses, and how these responses can uh, change the cycling, nutrient and uh, carbon cycling. And of course, uh, this uh, permafrost degradation impacts land usability and the quality of the water resources, the quality and the quantity, which directly affects the habitats of local and indigenous communities. So the question of sustainability of the water resources is critical for very different uh, local communities uh, where very often surface water are widely used. And so these projects aim understanding how the permafrost degradation can alter differently the uh, biogeochemistry of hydro system as well as the microbial communities, depending on the permafrost uh, degradation and soil settings. Our study will focus on key area, small watersheds, inland mostly, uh, where localized and rapid permafrost degradation remains under studies. So this better understanding, we hope, and collaboration with other projects that uh, study very often uh, uh, the uh, Arctic coast will contribute to understanding of the permafrost climate feedbacks. And while our approach is really multidisciplinary, because we, we include the geomorphology, social sciences, hydrogeology, microbiology, biochemistry, and so science that very often are not necessarily uh, interact with each other on the field at the same time, discussion. So that's really, really what we, what we like is to go together and have discussion right away uh, on the field. And uh, um, so we are studying a small key area. We're gonna do, of course, uh, we focus on some area to, um, to collaborate with other projects to, to be a complementary, mostly inland, a small watershed in Siberia and Alaska with different permafrost uh, characteristics, degradation and, and condition, climate and vegetation. And our study, we're focusing mainly on sites in Siberia. So of course, in 2001, 21, when our project started, uh, with the pandemic, uh, we it's prevented us from doing extensive field work in Siberia. And in 2000, of course, last year, with everyone talks, um, and today the war in Ukraine is doing exactly the same. So we haven't really started the, the project, uh, but we, we work more or less uh, separately with our Russian colleagues that continue to study our uh, study site, mainly in Central Equity, that we, we went there for, for several years before this project. So we continue the collaboration with them for that site. And thanks to collaboration with, uh, with colleagues from Montreal and Yukon University, we found a new site in the uh, Eastern Yukon, not far from the, uh, from the front uh, borderline with Alaska. Uh, where we, we did extensive work last year and we're going to come back uh, next year. Uh, but for cross comparison, we are collaborating with uh, with colleagues uh, from to to study still study a site in Western Siberia in Alaska and, and very recently in the uh, in south of the Hudson Bay um, in the near Churchill with uh, also uh, Canadian colleagues. So Still hope we are optimistic. We're gonna continue the, the good work, and we hope to uh, to to share the, this knowledge and and uh, of course exchange with everyone. Um, so to understand and compare the impact of permafrost degradation between the different sites, and that could be a key also to to collaborate with other other people. Uh, we would like to define several indicators of the vulnerability of soil, surface, and groundwater. Of course, it includes permafrost condition, greenhouse gases different dissolved elements, inorganic and organic carbon, but not only, uh, microbial communities and water resources. 
that's what we will try to 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 make um and we know uh, from uh, that the role of hydrology is very key in this response of these watersheds underlined by permafrost and strongly influence the emissions and the transport of carbon. So we're really analyzing what type of permafrost so and other factors can enhance or uh, decrease these impacts, biogeochemical impacts. Um, and we focus on the continuum permafrost hydro system and we really are focusing mostly on understanding most of the processes that we uh, can observe on the field and by a very low altitude remote sensing, such as a drone, really at small scale in this small watershed is very important. And most of them are understudied in, and, and they led to uh, really great rivers. So we really focus on this understudy watersheds where Tamokas is very important for the size of the watersheds. One of the other objective of this uh, project, and it's where it could be very interesting, and I heard a lot of a very good opportunity uh, today to to discuss, is really to develop outreach activities about climate change and about the evolution of permafrost in the Arctic at school, mostly primary school. Um, we we really are uh, designing and. We will produce a pedagogical handbook for school teacher with DIY activity to support education at school. And this is really based on the experience of many of our colleagues that did outreach activity for many years, but also with a collaboration with uh, several primary schools in France and uh, it's still stopped now, but in Central Equity, but we did for, for several years. And I think today I heard a lot of uh, good opportunity to collaborate. Here are some some uh, pictures of activities uh, in uh, in the in the in the area. We activities about permafrost carbon, but also about uh, cultural and uh, linguistic exchanges. Very interesting to to talk about how people how children live. Something very important for the French people was to see how what do we eat. You can see here on the left, present to Central Yakutia. And uh, also it was thanks to collaboration with this Office for Climate Education that are really expertise, the experts in doing education and helping education, supporting education. That's also something very important. So we have and we got developed a uh, collaboration with a school from Quebec, thanks to our uh, colleague Daniel Forti and Frédéric Bouchard to really expand this. So we are really happy to uh, to uh, to collaborate with other other projects. And just to finish, I'm going to talk by a project with uh, with colleagues, and it's going to be my last slide, uh, that also are involved in in, in in this project. And they talk about, it's called a We Saw project, colleagues from USCL Louvain in Belgium. And they really focus on the role of uh, mineral organic carbon interaction that really control the availability of this organic carbon. Thank you very much, and I will be happy to discuss uh, later with all of you. Uh, merci, Antoine. Sue Natalie from Permafrost Pathways is our next speaker. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm Sue Natali, and I'm a scientist at the Woodwolf Climate Research Center, and I'm going to give an overview of this project, which I guess I, I keep saying it's a new project, but it's now been a year that this, this project has been started. Um, and it's um, has a multiple different components to it. There's some sort of more traditional science components, but also it involves policy, environmental justice, and it's all focused around um, um, adaptation mitigation strategies for addressing permafrost thaw. And so the project is led by um, out of the Woodwell Climate Research Center, but we have a lot of um, collaborators and key partners at Harvard Kennedy School's Arctic Initiative and the Alaska Institute for Justice. Um, but then there's, I, I don't know, I've lost track of a number and I don't have a collaborator slide, but there's more than 10 collaborating institutions, um, dozen plus people on our flux steering committee, and then a number of um, Alaska Native uh, tribal partners who are part of this. And it was funded through the Ted Audacious Project. It started in last year and it's funded through um, 2027, I believe. Um, and I just wanna start off by acknowledging um, the land and the people where we work. Um, we we work, our work spans across the Arctic and Boreal regions, um, areas um, that have, um, 
then um, Indigenous people have lived in these areas for time immemorial. And we try to really um, recognize in the work that we do that while we are focused on climate impacts on the land and the people of these lands, um, these sort of climate impacts are always like interacting with a lot of other things that are going on, including um, impacts of um, colonialism and extractivism. Um, this is a project team at Woodwell. So I, and I highlight this because there's a lot of folks working on this and they are the ones who are doing all the work that I will be showing. Um, and we have a pretty amazing team of scientists, communications professionals and of policy experts. And then these are our partners at some of the founding organizations um, on the top, Harvard Kennedy School, Alaska Institute for Justice, Alaska Native Science Commission. And then um, on the bottom right are, is our, some of our partners from the tribes. Each one of the tribes we work with has a full-time person working um, on this project. And I'm only showing two there because I don't have pictures of the others right now. Um, and so, yeah, so as I said, our study region is the Pan-Arctic um, and Boreal region. So the permafrost area and the work that we're doing is motivated by the loss of permafrost and then the ecological, human and climate impacts of permafrost thaw. So um, our work focuses both on the direct effects of permafrost thaw on communities, ecosystems and infrastructure. And then also much of our work is fo focused on these ecosystem changes and impacts on carbon cycling. And that carbon cycling work spans across the Arctic region. Um, these are the sort of core components of this work. And so um, a large part of this is measuring, monitoring and modeling um, carbon fluxes from the permafrost region. Um, we're also working to co-create indigenous led adaptation framework in response to permafrost thaw and other um, climate changes that are happening. And then using this information to, um, I probably shouldn't use the word influence, to inform um, national and international climate policy. And so I'm just gonna run very quickly through each of these components. And so monitoring and modeling is focused on uh, current and future greenhouse gas emissions from the Northern region. We do our monitoring using um, eddy covariance um, equipment. So this measures carbon dioxide and methane. And the plan is to install 10 new towers and support existing towers that are um, across the Arctic region so that we can get a better understanding of the current carbon budget of, of the Arctic. And then we'll also be using this data in our modeling for projecting future carbon budgets. Um, and you know, in deciding on where we're installing these towers, this is done um, strategically. So first doing a representative analysis saying, where do we have towers now? Where are there gaps in our understanding? And so the open symbols here are places where there are eddy covariance towers. The filled ones are those that are measuring both CO2 and methane and being run year round. And then the yellow dots are ones that over the past year that the project supported. So um, this right here is one new tower that we installed in, um, in Churchill. That's in a wetland in Churchill. There actually was a tower there um, or nearby there a, a while ago. Um, but then there's also working with our collaborators. We've also provided support in some way, um, whether that's you know batteries to keep towers running through the year or methane analyzers. And um, I won't say too much more about that, but that work is from our team is being led by Kyle Arndt um, and also with um, a lot of input from our flux steering committee. Um, we're also doing a lot of monitoring using remote sensing because if we wanna know the carbon balance of the Arctic, these. Uh, eddy covariance towers, we can use that to sort of do some upscaling, but they're often not situated on disturbed areas. And so um, we're using, you know, high resolution satellite data and neural networks to map wildfires um, on the left. Also mapping, um, this is retrogressive thaw slumps, um, currently working on the Long Island peninsulas. And we just had a, a Yi Li Yang just has a, a nice publication that just came out about that. And so these data will be used to inform our Pan-Arctic carbon assessments. Um, and also to um, inform the modeling. And so the modeling work is uh, led by uh, Brendan Rogers and Elgin Jafaroff, and then also Helene Genet from UAF is closely involved in this. Um, and so we're building a data simulation framework to improve model estimates using DVM DOS 10 and then incorporating key processes like thermocarst, wildfire. And then we're running the model at uh, high spatial resolution, one to two kilometers across the um, Pan Arctic and Boreal region. Okay, I'm gonna go through this quickly. I'm gonna talk very briefly about adaptation and talking adaptation, we're talking about actions to moderate harm in response to climate change. And so 
Um, we'll be working with 10 tribes. This work is focused in um, Alaska. We have tribal agreements right now signed with six communities and four more will be coming soon. And these are all communities that are um, at risk and um, due to permafrost off flooding and or erosion. And many of them are having to make um, decisions which may include climate relocation. And so um, we're doing some work, some technical work on the ground. Um, the tribes are interested in monitoring permafrost thaw both on the ground and using satellite imagery to, to detect past rates of change, but also to use that information um, to, to, to make adaptation decisions. So using different modeling, higher resolution modeling um, to look at, you know, um, changes that are happening and spatial scales of say 30 meters and on one to two um, year time scales or and decadal time scales. Um, and then, so this is just an app, a survey one, two, three app. This is a survey that the communities are using to monitor storm damage. This is an impact of Murbach, uh, Typhoon Murbach, and also permafrost thaw. Um, and then we're also meeting with federal agencies in the US to, um, and the tribes to establish um, guidelines for communities who are making adaptation decisions. So for example, if a community decides to relocate, what are the site criteria for doing that? And it's currently something that doesn't um, exist in at least in the US, there's there's sort of not a, not a lot of guidance here. And then finally, just to wrap up, um, we also are focusing a lot on mitigation. And by this, I'm not talking about on the ground mitigation of permafrost thaw, but mitigation in terms of uh, global um, policy for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And much of this work is just you know, focused around this fact that current global climate policy doesn't fully account for emissions from permafrost. Um, and so when we think about our, our targets of 1.5 or 2 degrees Celsius, um, we're not, we're not, we're not going to meet those targets if we don't account for it. And so this is just some work, a uh, modeling work led by Rachel Traharn, sort of to put the full permafrost carbon feedback into our estimates, um, of, you know, and, and then getting this information to policymakers. So sort of a twofold, doing the models in a way that they're useful for policymakers, and then getting the information out there. So that involves, you know, going to the COP and, and other policy meetings leading up to the COP. And then we also have smaller policy or relatively smaller policy meetings um, led by our partners at, at Harvard, bringing in um, pretty high level members from the White House, from different agencies, from the tribes that we're working with. And these convenings are really focused on mapping out our both adaptation and mitigation policy as it relates to permafrost thaw. With that, I will stop. Sorry, it was very quick, um, but sorry for going over my time. Thanks everyone. Second last speaker of the day, Ted Schur from the Permafrost Carbon Network. Please introduce yourself. Yeah, great. Hello, everybody. Thanks for um, sticking around no matter what time zone you're in. Um, I'll try to give a brief overview of the project I've been leading. It's, um, it's the Permafrost Carbon Network is the name of the group, and we are doing synthesis science. And I thought today I would just give a short um, description of what the project is that we are um, that I'm representing and then actually just give you some of the key science um, findings from that because we've been running this network for over a decade now and a lot of sort of the questions that people had about permafrost carbon and climate we have kind of put that together in a recent publication um, so just to introduce the network, it's uh, funded by the National Science Foundation, the Permafrost Carbon Network, and we're not collecting new data here, but what we're doing is producing knowledge through research synthesis. So bringing together all the individual site studies into kind of a synthetic um, picture of what's happening with carbon that's stored in permafrost and its vulnerability to a warming Arctic. So that's been our objective for a while. Um, We've been doing this activity by running uh, workshops, bringing people together. We host an uh, annual workshop that's been um, held in conjunction with the AGU meetings. Uh, last couple of years, we've done those online, which has been successful in recruiting even new into that. And our idea is that if we're putting together our science um, information in advance, that we're really able to better kind of distill the findings of our science and communicate those findings to decision makers that often need information rapidly. So it's kind of laying the groundwork among scientists so that we have some answers when people are asking. 
So this um, has been led by myself. I also want to acknowledge Christina Shadel has been a big force behind um, the permafrost carbon network, although now she's joined Sue Natalia at the uh, Woodwell Climate Research Center on the permafrost pathways project that we just heard about. We've gotten lots of support from um, US uh, groups like Arcus that have helped us run um, workshops. And then really it's community effort. And so the, the products that we've gotten out have been really contributions by individual scientists that have joined the permafrost carbon network that have attended our all scientists meetings and then participated in synthesis um, products and really led them as well. And so it's um, a grassroots effort. We don't um, have specific agendas except to synthesize the science that is out there. So on that note, I thought I would just um, kind of give you our overarching question. We're focused primarily on the global impact of a changing Arctic. So we're thinking about um, organic carbon stored in permafrost and how much of that end up in the atmosphere. So we have this driving science question about the magnitude, the timing, and the form of the permafrost carbon release to the atmosphere in a warmer world. So it's been really helpful to have this sort of focused science question that we've been trying to answer. It's, it's something we can measure at the site scale, but understanding what that feedback is at the global scale is really what's relevant for climate. So how much of that frozen carbon is going to end up in the atmosphere? Is that going to happen over years or decades and even centuries? And then the release of carbon dioxide and methane, these two greenhouse gases with their different uh, climate forcings uh, really matter here. Um, I'm just going to give you some sort of snapshots that can be found in this paper. So this is a recent publication, end of 2022. It's um, open access. You can download this, but I'm hoping that it provides a bunch of sort of answers to things that you hear about in the media and elsewhere. So I'm going to just run through a couple of those bullet points, um, but of course you can download the paper and um, read about the science behind them. Uh, just thinking about how much carbon is there, this paper sort of increases the amount. We heard a lot about permafrost carbon being about double the atmosphere, but really we think it's triple the atmosphere. Um, that increase has to do with adding in um, organic carbon that we that is under sea in permafrost and really other deep sediments that are out there, but kind of poorly quantified at this point. But we feel fairly confident that there is a large climatically sensitive um, carbon pool that's there. Um, of course, the Arctic and the permafrost region is notable in that it contains 50% of the soil carbon that's found in biomes elsewhere in only 15% of the area. So we have sort of this disproportionate influence of Arctic ecosystems on this terrestrial feedback to climate that we're thinking about. Um, I'll say a little bit more about this point. So this is kind of magnitude, timing, and form. If we look at carbon dioxide plus methane at the scale of the whole permafrost region, we think that um, anywhere between 50 and 230 petagrams of carbon um, might be added to the atmosphere. And just like Sue said, we have to account for this extra carbon if we're thinking about meeting temperature targets by mitigating human carbon emissions. I'll show a couple more slides kind of describing what that range between 50 and 230 represents. Um, if, you, if you step back and ask, you know, how does Arctic carbon compare to other drivers of climate change? It's really accelerating so human burning of fossil fuels is the main driver. Arctic carbon emissions are likely to add another 10 to 15 percent on top of future fossil fuel emissions. So it's not the gorilla in the room. We still need to address human emissions, but it's adding to it. And so if we want to uh, meet temperature targets, we got to kind of account for this. If we look at just what's happening on land, um, and the fact that land right now is taking up some of human emissions, Arctic carbon actually could erase anywhere between 30 and 50% of that land carbon sink. So it's significant if we think about it in terms of the terrestrial biosphere. And then I think we've heard a lot today about um, all the processes going on in the Arctic. And I really think that slowing climate change as a whole could help avoid um, you know, surprises that are out there. I think we know that the Arctic is, um, is remote for many people. It's it's not densely populated, and I think there's lots to be learned, and we don't want to find out the hard way about changes that may happen. 
Um, let me just show you kind of one more slide sort of on that middle point. And it's thinking about the future. Of course, the future um, carbon emissions aren't set yet. It depends on what kind of trajectory the earth goes through and then part that's due to human actions that happen. And so you can find this figure in the paper, sort of a summary figure of, of this impact of carbon emissions from the Arctic. And it's combining both um, methane that's coming out of wetlands and anaerobic conditions and CO2 that's coming out of upland. And really the take home message here is that how much extra carbon comes out of the Arctic is both a function of what humans do. So what kind of um, fossil fuel emissions do we have and what kind of trajectory of climate change do people set the planet on? And then the response of the Arctic ecosystem, whether we have more landslides and abrupt thaw events that release carbon faster or slower, depending on how the systems respond. And the numbers on the chart itself are the extra carbon coming out of the Arctic. And you can compare that to the legend on the right-hand side that looks at country level fossil fuel emissions. And so the bottom line is that the permafrost region is like an entire extra country of uh, carbon emissions, but it's an unregulated um, country. We don't have policies in place that could um, control us directly. Well, on, on the country level, we are putting in policies in place to try to lower those numbers from what they might be. So we have to really take these together when we think about um, the future trajectory of climate change and the role in the Arctic in that. So I'm going to end my presentation there. Um, I have the same sound bites again, but thanks very much. If you guys have any key messages that you wanted to share or something that you feel like you weren't able, then I thought we could just do a go around and everyone can have a minute to kind of um, provide a final statement um, from each of you. And why don't we start with Tom, because Tom, you were our first speaker. And um, if questions come in, I, I will bring those up as well. But Tom, yeah, take the floor. Yeah, I, I just feel that the, my research is um, uh, sort of uh, moving towards uh, machine learning for hazard pr prediction and hazard mapping. I feel for this permafrost related problem, I feel it's very intriguing. Uh, to me is how to incorporate the permafrost uh, physics into machine learning algorithms so that we have this uh, physics informed machine learning. I feel uh, that's the, what we want to accomplish. So I feel we, we, we need to establish a lot. We need to have a lot of data and probably uh, establish some collaboration. So I, I, I think that's what, we are, uh, that's what uh, I'm looking for in, in, in permafrost day today. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Tong. Um, Antoine. Thank you. Um, but from my point of view, I think it's very important to continue education and to, to really uh, make sure that everyone is aware of this, what's happening. And that what's happening in the Arctic will, of course, impact us in the other latitudes, especially in Europe and North America. So. Um, not only, of course. So it's it's something as a scientist that we really need to spread the knowledge, and, and also doing uh, just day like this, to be able to to be aware of uh, the other project of other person, meet in conference, and and really try to debate and and interact with all the data that we have and get get more, but to better understand. Thanks, Antoine. Um, Sue, did you want to share any final words? Yeah, I mean, I guess I would just want to kind of reiterate some of the points that other speakers have mentioned is just, this has been, a, this is a really useful um, to have this opportunity to sort of have this knowledge exchange, but also to think about places where we can collaborate and where there, we may leverage other projects. And I know for us, like we've, we've gotten um, like the work we do can only be done based on like work that many others have done. And so we really do value like the data collection that the community has been doing and making that available and would also like, like to reciprocate. So I think, you know, we have a lot of opportunities to build on our collaborations. And so if that's um, people see opportunities for that, I would really love to chat further, but then also just thank everybody who's data and work that we, you know, that we've leveraged for the work that we're doing so far. Thanks, Sue. 
Ted, did you want to share anyone, the last presenter of a great day? Yeah, I think this is a great um, thing that you guys are doing, hosting the Permafrost Day. I think networking across projects and countries is super important. I mean, there's been big changes, I think, um, in the last year has been referred to the last several years about the ability of people to meet together and then even the willingness or the ability to share data. And I think we know as scientists and people interested in science-based management that um, more information is often better, but it still takes kind of bringing it together and trying to get a clear view of what it is we're seeing. And I think that's best done with a bunch of people thinking together and cooperating about um, you know, what it all means. And so I'm happy to be a part of this today and look forward to kind of future networking events. Thanks. Great. Well, we really appreciate we really appreciate everybody that contributed today, and thank you for for everyone that um, came to the discussions or that participated as a speaker.